Cuadragésima tercera semana del humanismo, ética y educación como herramientas contra la brecha social. Agradecemos la presencia de la comunidad de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras de la UASH. Además, al público que nos sigue por todas nuestras redes sociales oficiales, por las cuales estamos transmitiendo en vivo esta Semana del Humanismo. Antes de iniciar con la presentación de nuestros panelistas, queremos solicitarle a quienes tengan preguntas, las compartan en el chat para ser leídas al finalizar la conferencia. Muchas gracias. Es así que este día nos da gusto recibir a la maestra Lisset Drusila Flores. Es profesora titular de tiempo completo en la Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua. Tiene doctorado en lingüística aplicada de la Universidad de Southampton de Reino Unido. Imparte cursos de la licenciatura y posgrado en TESOL e historia estadounidense y británica. Sus intereses de investigación incluyen tutoría, identidad, autonomía y aprendizaje a través de redes sociales y aplicaciones. A la doctora Irlanda Olave Moreno, profesora e investigadora titular de tiempo completo en la Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua. Tiene un doctorado en educación e imparte cursos de pregrado y posgrado de investigación, de sol y literatura británica. Ha publicado varios artículos sobre procesos de aprendizaje y educación con regulatorios, exógenos y dialécticos y ha presentado numerosos y, se ha presentado, y los ha presentado en numerosos gresos. Y a la doctora Ana Cecilia Villarreal Ballesteros, es profesora de tiempo completo en la licenciatura de lengua inglesa y del posgrado en educación de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras de la UASH desde 1995 a la fecha. Tiene la maestría en, en educación del Instituto Tecnológico en Estudios Superiores de Monterrey y es doctora en SLAT por la Universidad de, Ari de Arizona. E imparte cursos en el área de lingüística aplicada, TESOL y formación docente. Pertenece al Cuerpo Académico de Investigación en Lenguaje y Educación. Ha realizado diversas presentaciones en congresos nacionales e internacionales. Es autora, coautora de diversas publicaciones sobre el aprendizaje, la enseñanza y formación docente. Quienes nos presentan la conferencia Pre and During Pandemic Reflections of Pre-Service Teachers. Adelante, por favor. Hi, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. We are really pleased to be here this morning sharing uh, some of our work with our colleagues and students and anyone who was interested in this topic and is uh, uh, following us over the social media in this presentation. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about this uh, uh, little research that we have been conducting, uh, Dr. Irlanda and Lucila, about the pre and during pandemic reflections of pre-service teachers. Business. Uh, during this Semana del Humanismo. Uh, as you know, we work in the Lengua Inglesa program who has been running for 39 years uh, this year. And it has done, uh, throughout its history, it has done uh, different reforms and curriculum redesigns. And now it's, uh, it's under a current major reform at the institutional level. We all know that we have been working on a new model of education at the watch, and we are designing what the program is going to be like. And with this pandemic, uh, we have uh, new challenges have appeared, and we have been trying to identify which are those uh, challenges that students and teachers ourselves face during this uh, current pandemic. Next. And uh, talking about teacher education programs, uh, in which like the Lengua Inglesa one, that one of its objectives is to prepare uh, language teachers, is how to including the program relevant con content that novice language teachers can actually use in real situations when they go out in the job market and get a teaching job, because there's always been identified a certain gap between what uh, teacher education programs offer to um, uh, language teachers, to teachers in preparation and the realities they face once they are out there in the schools with their students. And we are trying to close this gap that uh, exists between 
what we provide as education for teachers and the realities they face. So for this, uh, we conducted this little research about identifying the new trends in the challenges faced by pre-service teachers taking the practical course, which is taken in the ninth semester, previous to the pandemic and during the pandemic in order to adjust our program to help future teachers cope with the demands. Because as we know, this uh, pandemic is not over and it's certainly going to bring about some changes that are going to stay uh, with us forever, right? We have to live with certain adjustments, with certain modifications in the way we do things, especially in teaching. And what we are trying to do is try to uh, identify what are the major challenges that uh, student uh, teachers are facing nowadays. So for this, we uh, included some participants which uh, were taking the practical course during 2018 and 2020. And uh, we were analyzing the products they produced in the practical course, uh, these 30 pre-service teachers uh, and before the pandemic and uh, during the pandemic, 14 pre-service teachers that participated in this study. What were the instruments that we used for the analysis of uh, for this uh, project? Well, we took the portfolios of pre-service teachers that include uh, a teaching philosophy, some journals they have to write during their practical, and other reflection tasks. And what we did is we did a content analysis, analysis focusing on uh, the identification of challenges, challenges perceived by pre-service teachers during uh, this time they were doing the practice. And what I'm going to present this morning is the reflections uh, that have to do with their journals, the journals that they write every time they face the practicum that they have to teach classes, they have to write a journal. And these journals reflect their struggles and how they cope with the challenges that they are facing while uh, teaching their courses. And some of the challenges that we identify have to do with uh, the students. So pre previous to the pandemic, uh, the teachers uh, in preparation were, uh, were seeing that students uh, will not get along uh, with each other. And, and they had problems organizing classwork in terms of uh, how to pair the students uh, to work together in the classrooms, how to motivate them, how to challenge uh, the students enough uh, so they would uh, feel motivated to participate in the class. One of the major challenges they faced was how to control students' behavior, right? Because they were doing their practicum with kids, with teenagers, and it was difficult for them. This is one of the major challenges that service teachers face in the practical course, like uh, classroom control. Also balancing participation was a challenge because some students tend to participate more than others. Uh, how to learn the students' names, uh, keeping them focused and attentive in the class, and sometimes the students lack of participation in the class. However, during the pandemic, one of the major challenges was not being able to monitor students. Uh, the students' lack of participation became major in their practical course, how to engage the students in their class, the students not responding, the students not paying attention, and the students not even turning on their cameras. As you know, this is something that we all have experienced as teachers. What do we do with the students that do not turn on their cameras? Do we just let them uh, be that way? Are they really paying attention to the class or are they doing something more? So what we can see is that the major challenge that uh, pre-service teachers are uh, seeing now, uh, Lucy, the next please. 
this, uh, we see that there was a shift from regulating students' behavior in the classrooms uh, versus uh, a bigger challenge, how to connect to your students while you are teaching over a camera. And we can see that this uh, is one of the major shifts. This is uh, one of the participants' contributions in the journal, and we're using pseudonyms to, uh, so they will not be identified. One, th one thing I noticed will be a challenge will be a challenge is that most of them keep their cameras off and don't speak much. So as you can see, uh, this is evidence of one of the challenges that uh, free service teachers were facing. Now, what about their teaching skills? Uh, previous to the pandemic, some teachers uh, were worried about their skills explaining difficult topics, the efficient use of the board and flashcards, organizing group work, relying on technology because sometimes they prepare a PowerPoint presentation and sometimes electricity went off and then uh, what to do in those situations when you are in the classroom with a group of students. Uh, another major uh, concern for these pre-service teachers was how to balance the use of the mother tongue versus the use of the target language and how to read the students in the sense of are they understanding what's going on in the classroom? Do they like the activities that uh, they as teachers were proposing? And we can contrast this with what happens during the pandemic. Uh, now the major concern was how do I explain a certain topic over a camera? What is the efficient use of apps and videos and other gadgets? And now what happens in reality is that if there's no technology, no electricity, or sometimes if the apps uh, go down as we uh, Leave yesterday with uh, with WhatsApp and Facebook. Without technology, simply there's no class. It's not even about what do I do if there's no electricity. If you don't have an electricity, simply you don't have class, and you have to deal with that situation. You have to be prepared to face that and uh, come up with solutions in, uh, for future uh, classes. Uh, what about the efficient use of time? Because the camera uh, time, the sessions that we have over internet uh, proceed in a different pace as face-to-face uh, -face situations, and they have to make an efficient use of time. So they let students uh, time for participating, for clearing doubts, etc. And also another major concern is how to grade students with online tools. As you know, this is a major concern because we have to shift our uh, strategies about grading students. If you give the students a test over the internet, you know that they're going to uh, share the answers with the rest of the class. So what do you do to <laughs> deal with that situation and how can you assess the students in a more realistic way whether they are learning or not, what you are trying to teach in the class. Next, please. So from learning the use of traditional tools, the previous to the pandemic, we passed to quickly learning new te technologies and online tools. We have to be updating our uh, uh, skills as teachers every day, every time with new technologies, and we have to find for new resources that can help us with this uh, situation. And we have here uh, next uh, a quote from another student that says, I had a lot of trouble uh, teaching them, especially when I was using the virtual blackboard that I was supposed to use for that class. I didn't like using it, especially because it made my computer slower and I wasted a lot of time teaching them using it. So not only learning, new technologies and new uh, apps, but learning how to use them efficiently. Continue, please. Uh, in online classes, family life and routines are not separate from school life, and this is something very interesting. Both aspects, aspects are merged in everyday life, not only in the life of the teacher, but also in the life of the students because they are taking classes at home. And so you cannot separate as you, we did in the past, the school life from family life. Okay. 
next week. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, now it's my turn to speak. I hope you can hear me well. Um, another aspect of our study was asking the students for a teaching philosophy. Preservist teachers called teaching philosophies. And um, let me use a metaphor for explaining what is a teaching philosophy. It's like if you had a GPS and you know where you want to get, you know exactly the, let's say that the objective you have, you have the, the destination, let's say. And this teaching philosophy allows you to get there. You may encounter bumps in the road, you may encounter obstacles, but there, if you have a destination, if you have a, a good GPS, let's say, you will get to your destiny, to your destination, not destiny, destination. So a teaching philosophy is a statement that explains a teacher's perspective on teaching and how he or she will apply that perspective to their teaching environment. Everybody has a teaching perspective, a teaching philosophy. Next, please. There's a connection between having a teaching philosophy in it and the way you teach. Uh, research findings, findings support the connection between philosophical positions and educational practice. That means that all of us who teach have an idea of where we, go on, where we want to go, how to get there. And this is what we wanted to find out from our participants. Next, please. This is the general task that we gave them. We asked the pre-service teachers, give us a general overview as you, for you, of you as a teacher. What, why do you teach? Uh, we wanted to find out what they, what they thought was their teaching styles. What is unique about your teaching style, for example, and their teaching goals. And we asked them to write an essay um, at the beginning of the practicum and then another one at the end of the practicum. Next, please. So we saw that there was a shift in teaching philosophies. When we compare pre-service teachers before the pandemic and during the pandemic, there was a change because we obviously, it's like if I use the metaphor again of the GPS, it's not the same knowing the, your direction and there's no traffic jam, uh, everything is clear, it's not raining, etc. But then if it's raining, if the streets are closed, then you will probably have difficulties getting there, more difficulties. So if I'm, if I'm using this uh, metaphor correctly, uh, the pandemic was like the rain when you were trying to get to your destination. Be I mean, plus having to deal with the everyday problems that preservative teacher encounters, now they have to deal with one more problem, one more challenge, the pandemic. Next, please. So, one of the things that changed, and that was like, I'm going to discuss mainly three things that we saw that changed with their teaching philosophies. One of the things was that the, let's say the objective of the, of the teaching. Uh, before the pandemic, pre-service teachers were very concerned with completing tasks, completing objectives, academic objectives, where uh, what happened uh, during the pandemic, they were more concerned with social issues. Uh, I have there a definition that I cannot see very well, uh, but um, can, can you please move a little bit um, so I can read from there? Because I cannot see it, Ms. Liz. You just need to that. move your, your layout because it's your layout. Uh, it's mine. Okay, well, mm -hmm. let me read it from, from here because I cannot move it. So task-oriented pre-service teachers focus on short-term targets. Um, they wanted to make any, and, and they wanted like, for example, to finish an exam, to prepare the, the students for an upcoming test, et cetera. Where uh, social goals uh, reflected, this is when the teachers, the service teachers wanted to make an impact or provide or preserve social amenities or infrastructure. I'm going to show you two examples of how the, the uh, what, what, what driving them changed. Uh, can you please uh, move, okay. You have here Karen. Karen was a teacher that I was teaching before the pandemic. And she says, she wrote, I love it when I see that students have good grades in their exams or in the final grades, because that means that they have liked the class. This is clearly a task driven goal. She wanted the students to have success in the exams. That was the priority of, of Karen. Then during the pandemic, uh, Tabata told us, I created an atmosphere of confidence and trust during the classes. Apart from that, I also engage with the students in a more personal way. 
the concern was not anymore on having good grades, but you said, I want the students to connect, to be engaged in the process, in the learning process. So there was in some of the pre-service teachers, there was a shift from task-driven goals to social connecting goals. Next, please. Okay, another thing that changed that we saw another shift was in terms of the concern that the students had when they were teaching. Before the pandemic, uh, they were very concerned with classroom management, like Dr. Villarreal explained, right? They how to keep or the class organized, orderly, the students attentive, and academically productive students during the class. That was one of the concerns that they expressed the most. During the pandemic, however, they wanted to keep students motivated, they wanted to maintain meaningful relationships that promote engagement. Let me show you two examples from, from two journals. Okay, so we have here Melissa in, uh, that says that before the pandemic, she was teaching before the pandemic and she says, the hard thing about teaching is not only explaining and making sure that students understand, but, it's all, but it also involves keeping the students on task, being able to have classroom management. So there's clearly a concern for management. We got to remember that these students were teaching in face-to-face -face classrooms. They had, to, they had to manage the class. They had to be able to, to, keep, to control the class, which is very different than teaching online. The focus is no longer on maintaining, let's say, the order of the students, but it says, uh, Grecia said, for example, participation in class should not be forced. I look up for activities that are discussion generating, interesting and fun. Uh, the students will not participate because I will raise them point of the grades. In other words, notice how the shift, there was a shift from controlling the classroom because of no obvious circumstances, they had the students in front of them versus having the students online where now the concern was how do I keep them motivated? Now that third and the last thing that I focus on the teaching philosophies or that we, that we did was student accountability versus contextual circumstances. Let me explain this. So preservist teachers before the pandemic were more ready to let their students assume responsibility for their success and failure. In other words, the one who is responsible uh, in the majority of the journals, they told us the ones who are responsible, the ultimate responsible for the learning process is the student. If he or she doesn't pay attention, if he or she doesn't uh, good, do, good well in the, in the exam, is their fault. Then during the pandemic, this changed a little bit because uh, teachers recognize that contextual matters of home circumstances and resources might have influenced learning. Let's, let's put it in a different way. They, they recognize that per, perhaps a student was studying, was participating, but that student has internet problems, Wi-Fi problems. It's not the fault anymore of the student, but it's the contextual circumstances. So in acknowledging this change, I'm going to show you these two, these two examples to see this shift. Before the pandemic, uh, pre-service teacher Adiana said, it is important for students to realize that they're able to do things on their own, to advance on their own and to think of their own. So here, uh, Adiana is saying, okay, so the agency is in the student. The student is responsible for the learning process and regardless what happens regardless of circumstances. But then Eric said, no one learns English in a couple of months. Everyone struggles in the path of learning. The journey, they understand this is happening. The journey might be that bad. Now, this is acknowledging that things sometimes go beyond the control of the learner, that sometimes you have to consider what, go, what goes on in the context of that person. Okay, this is the last one then. And the next, uh, Dr. Flores is going to give you uh, some um, examples of the final reflections of the students. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, as you can see, we are working with different instruments and different activities that we give our uh, practicantes during their practicum course. So <clears throat> you already saw what they thought at the beginning, what they thought during the whole uh, path. And now we're going to see like at the end, so then what? because the purpose of practicing, of getting this course, of practicum course, is that you learn through practice, right? As you know, because here we have some participants uh, within the Zoom session that are uh, students. <clears throat> you have been taking TESOL courses since fourth semester, so uh, then it's time to put it into practice, because as you know, it is not the same to do it in the micro teachings than to go and actually 
like be with the with the actual students, right? To actually be responsible of somebody else's learning. So after our students finish their practicum, they need to answer a worksheet that is about their final reflection. They need to write an essay and we give them some questions to guide them. These are some of the questions, not all of them, but just some of the questions. <clears throat> One of them is, uh, what do you feel are the most important things that you learn? <clears throat> what kind of relationship did you establish with your pupils and the staff? Your strengths as a language teacher, but also your limitations. So like we want our students to focus on what they think they are, um, they did best and what they think they need to improve. <clears throat> Their highest point uh, when they were teaching, like what was the, that moment that made them like, yeah, I love teaching. This is my moment to shine. And uh, to what extent did they get involved in the activities other than in the English lessons? <clears throat> because as you can imagine, once that you are immersed in a, in a school, when, when you are actually working at the school, you don't just go and, uh, and teach your class. No, but you start getting involved in different kinds of activities that make you part of this identity of this community where you are working. And the last question that we ask them, and this is one of the most interesting in my opinion, is did I love teaching? Because sometimes, as you know, some of the students want to teach when they enter Lengua Inglesa, we have two very clear paths, right? Uh, teaching and translation. Many people do both, but at first it's very common that you want to do more than none other. So before I show you the answers, I want to ask the people that are here, the participants here, do you want to teach? So just right there in the chat, yes or no? Do you want to teach? Yes, yes, yes. We have some no's, we have yes. We have maybes, I don't know anymore. Okay, so that's something that happens a lot because we have seen that during practicum, some student teachers are changing their identity. Like at first they were like, no, I will never teach. Not even if you kill me, I will not teach. Not even if you send me to those uh, squid games, I will not teach, never ever. And then they start uh, participating with the students and they actually like it. So we have had students that didn't like it. And then they said, no, I, I do like it now. So I, I'm considering it. Or others that believe that they were incapable of teaching because they were afraid of being in front of a classroom. But then they, they realized that they could and they like it. But sometimes it also happens the opposite, no? like people who wanted to teach and they said, no, mejor no, <laughs> at least not to this particular group of students, right? To this age or to this level. And that's fine, but that is what practicum is for. So that you challenge yourselves and so that you see what you are able to, to do, obviously with the help of us. So this is what we found. <clears throat> Pre-pandemic, uh, student teachers realized that they gained confidence. Uh, they felt more confident after their, the whole semester teaching in front of the students. Uh, they also began having, uh, feeling a very close relationship with the students and the staff. So they began working with collaboration. And that is something important too, because as teachers, sometimes we forget about that. We forget that when we are teachers, we are a team. We have a team that backs up, uh, that has our back, un barrio que nos respalda, el barrio académico, yeah? So we have other teachers that we can ask for help. We have our administratives, uh, our administration that also helps us. And of course, that we are also working with the students. The students, we are not just teaching them, but we are also learning from the students. And this is something that one of our participants said, um, Alberto, he said that he felt like he was learning with a friend, that one of the students tell him that. And he really liked that because this particular student was like not so involved in the English classes, but when he came and began teaching as he was more dynamic and he was, well, more fun, he, uh, the student liked the classes. So they said like, oh, this is so cool. It's like learning with a friend. So you don't feel like you are learning, but you are, yeah? Um, they realized also, they said that they realized that ha they have to be firm or strict uh, during the first lessons, like to set themselves at their ground, like to say, okay, I'm the teacher, because as obviously our practicantes are very young, right? They are your age, <laughs> the age of our students, they're like 22, 23 years old. 
Sometimes they are doing their practicum with high school students or with university students. So they are more or less the same age. And it is common that students want to cross that line of respect. So student teachers said that in the classroom, they had to be firm or strict at first, and then little by little behave according to the ways that the, the classroom responded, right? Uh, they became involved in events. Uh, some of them considered that that was important because students learned to see them not only inside the classroom, but also getting involved in other activities. And something very important, they began uh, socializing with the other teachers, yeah? So once that you start getting to know the other teachers, you develop this camaraderie. I don't know how to even say it, but um, you feel supported. You feel that you are not alone. And then you have like your buddy there to ask whenever you are struggling. You have people to tell you, oh, I've had this student and this is what you can do. So that has helped them. They realize the importance of planning. Uh, the ones that are taking the planning course or the ones who already took it, you know that planning a lesson is very important, but that doesn't mean that you are going, that is not a script. You are just planning, you are predicting and preparing yourselves. So they realize that it is important that uh, we are not lying, Lydia and I, when we tell you plan your lessons <laughs> in planning course, but that it is actually important because it helps you be ready and to not feel like uh, stress if something goes wrong, because there are less chances of something going wrong because you have a plan B, yeah, you are ready for what comes there. And uh, they also learn about adaptability, uh, that things are not going to happen the way that you want them to happen. And that's something that happens obviously in all classes because we are working, when we teach, we are working with humans. So we don't know how they are going to react. Even if you are super prepared, you don't know what your students are going to ask you. You don't know how long a, a lesson is going to last. Even an activity, probably you thought, eh, this is super easy, I will cover it in five minutes. Tenga, like, no, you take 50 minutes and you haven't finished. So you, uh, student teachers learn to adapt themselves. And they said that practicum also strengthened their teaching uh, identity because they like it. They realize that it is not as bad as they thought it would be. And the ones that they like it, they were like, oh, I absolutely love it. I realized that this is definitely what I want to do. Now, during the pandemic, uh, there were also obviously different challenges. For example, um, students learn to use different tools. Um, the te student teacher, sorry, because now we had to use Zoom, Meet, or uh, Teams, or whatever other platform that they want us to use. And in addition to that, Classroom, Moodle, <laughs> yeah, whatever that the school is asking you to use. And literally, obviously, nobody had this pandemic like, I have no pandemia, I prepare it all. No. So it was literally something that was from one week to the other, if you remember. And as teachers, this was also something like, ah, I need to learn how to use this and I, I, I need to use tools that I have never used in my life or probably tools that I didn't even know that existed. So they learn to use different tools uh, in their classes and we are still learning. And I say we, because we are also teachers and we are always learning. Uh, they realize also the importance of planning just as with the uh, pre-pandemic ones. They also wanted to have a friendly but strict relationship with students because they realized that if they were too friendly, students wouldn't participate or they wouldn't even log into their classes, yeah? So obviously they needed to kind of said that they were the figure of authority, they are the teachers. But at the same time, if you are too strict and you are working online, it is easier that students ignore us, right? It's like, si sí, señora, si, sí. apago la cámara y me voy a lavar atrás, ya me voy a dormir. So students realized that they had to keep the attention of the students constantly throughout the uh, rapport that they establish with them. They have to have a good relationship with them so that they want to stay in their classes. They also learn from their mentors. Um, a mentor is like the actual teacher of the class, the one that is helping our practicantes. And some of them realized that they had really good mentors. At first they said, this was kind of annoying because the mentor was always asking me things but then they began seeing it as something helpful because mentors became, uh, some of them were very, very, very involved. And they even stayed after the classes with them to tell them, okay, this is what you did. This is what I, I suggest you to do. 
And this is something important also in the pandemic environment because online, sometimes we feel alone. We feel that we are working on our own and like nobody is going to help us and like it is your responsibility only. And this takes me back to what I was telling you of collaboration, of the importance of bonding with your colleagues because probably, I don't know something, uh, but Irlanda or Ceci can help me and that is going to help me improve my class. So we are helping each other and that is something good. Uh, also, they realize the importance of planning too. Um, for example, this student, mentioned, this student mentioned that she liked, uh, she learned to design the classes according, according to what students like. Remember guys in sixth semester needs analysis. So that is important because that makes you design activities that are according to what students like. So it's more likely that they will pay attention to you. Adaptability, definitely. I think that adaptability is one of the uh, things that they mentioned the most, like they realized that they could do it, that it was not something impossible. And that especially something very important that I think is that student teachers realize in both contexts, because both mentioned adaptability, that what they have been learning during their, their whole major, all these semesters that you take TESOL courses, it's actually useful <laughs> because sometimes we tend to do that, right? Like we take a lot of classes and ay, esto es obvio, esto para qué, maestra, ya lo sabemos. And now we really don't know it until we are actually faced into a circumstance in which we need to use that knowledge. So that's something that also strengthens their teacher identity. So uh, students become very emotional. At first, student teachers are like, ay, no, que miedo, no quiero ir, y, que horror, tengo pesadillas. But then, they start liking them and they start bonding also with the students because they see that students like their classes too. And of course, we all like it when people like our, our job, right? We like to be praised in one way or another. And if you say, no, I don't, you're lying and you know it. <laughs> so well, <clears throat> uh, the main challenges that they, uh, we had were also with classroom management, uh, as my, uh, my friends uh, mentioned, uh, it's hard to deal with the students, but that is the purpose of practicum. It's not the same when we do it in the micro teachings that we uh, pretend that we are students, but we already know the language. So it's not the same to actually be with students that really, if you don't solve the problem, they will not understand you. So classroom management was uh, an issue. Uh, getting students attention was also an issue and to design fun classes during the, <clears throat> during the uh, um, pre-pandemic, like face-to-face. -face. Um, uh, English speaking environment, this is something that happens a lot. A lot of our student teachers always say, no, I'm going to use only, only English and never again Spanish, es más, no hablo español. But then they go to practicum and they realize that if they don't use their mother tongue at least a bit, students will get lost. And then they stop paying attention because they have no idea what you're saying. So then you have to learn to use that, to have a balance with, between the mother tongue and uh, the target language, of course, obviously according to the level of the students, to, to have them this, uh, into this process of uh, having just uh, an English only class. And motivation. Many students don't like English classes. If you ask students, they always think that they are, most of the times, they think that they are boring because in the classes that they have had, most teachers just go and, okay, vamos a hacer el ejercicio uno del libro, eh, muchachos, y ahora el dos, y ahora el tres, y pues sí, y el cuatro también, yeah? So there is no, nothing dynamic, and especially students don't use the language. So classes become grammar-based or vocabulary-based instead of based on communication. And that's why students don't learn. So our practicantes needed to have this dynamic in which they made them actually use the language. And during the pandemic, attendance. As students don't get online, they don't, um, they don't connect, they don't log into the sessions. And another, as many students have their cameras off, you are talking to names, yeah? You are not talking to the actual students. So don't be afraid to ask them to turn on their camera or activities so that you can actually relate to people because you don't recognize them. Then you can go to the supermarket or whatever and they, want, they probably will know who you are because they see you, but you won't know who they are. <clears throat> so this not recognizing the students kind of breaks this bond between the teacher and the student because you don't, you don't associate a face with the student. And also, so it is hard to establish a relationship. 
And it is also hard to, to see if they are understanding or not because you cannot see their expressions. Another challenge was the lack of communication with some mentors. Some mentors just didn't um, follow with the student teachers. So they had to be like following them and texting them all the time so that they get a little bit of support and lack of participation. Like student teachers usually co um, complain that they ask a question to the students and they don't answer. So what you can do here is you ask them directly, like, okay, I see that this person is not participating. So Jocelyn Escobar, you answer this question. So don't be afraid of engaging students if they don't engage on their own, because that is part of our job as uh, teachers. So as conclusion, we learned that we need to empower the student teachers to come with alternatives and to encourage them to identify the needs and problems of the context, not only of the students, but of the whole context, and to come up with a possible new routes, like what can we do then to solve this problem? And also, <clears throat> uh, the practicum during the coronavirus pandemic obviously was a reminder that we have to be adaptable and that we are always learning, guys. If you decide to get into teaching or also into translation, you will realize that you are always learning. Even if you've been teaching for 200 years, you need to be learning because generations are different. The students that I have now are different from the students that I had five years ago and from the ones that I had 10 years ago and so on. So you cannot keep teaching in the same way because students have literally a different chip, yeah? So it's different and we have to adapt. Um, and as uh, how, how can we adapt our program or language lesson program? Well, we also need, we realize that we need to teach you <laughs> how to use uh, technology to teach because it was something that we didn't consider that much. We do have a course by uh, Professor Jose Luis Valdez, who teaches the technology in, te in teaching. So, but we realized that we need more. We need to start adapting technological tools into our TESOL classes too, so that you learn to teach both face-to-face -face and online, because this is a new um, environment, a new context that is here to stay and that is providing a lot of opportunities for new teachers. For example, now we have graduates that are teaching Chinese students or uh, people in Europe or people in different countries because now we have this uh, adaptability of online teaching. So even though the pandemic struck very hard, there were some things that were okay, that were good, that we can take advantage of and we should. So we need to learn to deal and cope with the emotions also of the students on virtual environments. So we need to learn to engage. We need to learn to create this connection with the students so that we are able to teach them. And that's all for our part. These are our emails, or I don't know if we have time for questions here. I don't know, no sé si alguien tenga alguna pregunta. Estás en silencio, Jasly. <laughs> Angélica Gutiérrez tiene una pregunta, ¿no? Eh, nosotros tenemos que quitar el mute, Jocelyn. Ok. Ok. Angelina, okay. Angelina. Ange, Angie. Angie. Let me see if I can. Oh. Ya le piqué. Ay, listo. Ay, ok, yo estaba acá. <laughs> La hora de silencio, perdón. Sorry. Sí. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Este, no, es justo les iba a, a decir que pues las dudas que, que tuvieran nos las escribieran por chat o en Facebook en la transmisión, no sé si hay algunas. Angelina, ¿se tiene pregunta? Pregunten. Yeah, yes. Um, so, um, it was mentioned before that one of the focuses that teachers had before, like pre-pandemic, was... Um, to see how the students were getting better and learning more through the exams and the grades that they had in the exams. And after the pandemic started, uh, the focus changed into the students engaging into classes. Do you think that will be maintained after the pandemic? 
or what things could you do to to go to that approach? Okay, if, if I if you want to answer, then you yeah, or you first. Oh, you... I can I can try okay. uh, because okay. what she what Angie refers to was um so the sample that I had from two of the the diaries that I that are analyzed. I think that's a very good um that's a very good learning that the pandemic taught us to consider all the contextual factors really uh, that impact the learning process. Um, that um, that was like one of the things that we saw, right? Before the pandemic, we were really concerned with management, with passing exams, but we sometimes forget about motivating and engaging learners. I, I am guilty myself. Uh, before the pandemic, I had a different way of teaching literature, for example. The pandemic taught me that I had to be more open to the students' uh, input, that I had to give them a chance to speak that I had to give them questions to answer. Before the pandemic, I was like lecturing all the time and they were just taking notes. So yes, Angie, I agree with you. This cannot stop once the pandemic, hopefully one day the pandemic will be gone, but the lesson is there and we should take advantage of that lesson. We have to learn to adapt. We have to be able to connect with learners regardless if there's a pandemic or not. I agree completely with you. The focus should not no more, not anymore will be on the grades, right? But on the connection, on the engagement. Well, that's what I think. Yeah, it's just that we realize and we've seen that uh, through our studies, because this is just one part of many that we are doing, doing right now, uh, that engagement is super important because if we don't engage with the students, students just get lost, they don't pay attention. And even though we knew that this happened during the classroom, because even though you are there sitting, you may be daydreaming or thinking about whatever else, but not paying attention. But it is more obvious when we have the online classes, because if you don't engage, like the participants said, like the student teacher said, they don't, they don't respond. And this is like all the memes have been going on there. You are like in a spiritual session, like uh, Angelina, you know, study, because you need to be asking them. So you need to think of new strategies and tools so that you can actually get them involved. Y loco, pequeño comercial, de eso vamos a hablar las maestras Paola y Omaure y yo el jueves a, a las nueve. <laughs> so we will be talking about strategies to engage students too. So I uh, just like a, as a follow up, yeah. But yeah, engagement is very important. And I think this is one of the key lessons that we've been learning during these um, changes of context. There are two questions uh, in the chat. I don't know, Ceci, if you would like to, to uh, answer them. Andy says, in your experience, what would you say has been the hardest part while online teaching? Well, what uh, we get from the reports of uh, pre-service teachers and from our own experience as teachers, is how to maintain students' focus, uh, motivated and attentive to the classes. I think teachers as uh, well as the students, uh, we have lost part of the motivation that we had to, uh, when going to school, when getting out of, the, of our houses and going to the school. And it's been harder to maintain attention, focus, and motivation for both, I would say, teachers and students. And I think that's the major challenge. As to whether we're going back to school, uh, there was a question uh, by someone. I've been asking that uh, for the last two weeks. And I we don't, don't know. Have, we don't know. We don't have mm -hmm. an answer. We know that the campus in Juarez is resuming classes this semester. And I think that will be like an experiment for the Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua to see what happens if we go back to the classrooms. And then uh, hopefully they will take a decision by the end of this semester. And we would know if there's a chance that we go back to the classrooms next semester, I think. Uh, at this point, we have uh, mixed feelings. Some of us want to go, or in some ways we want to go back, and um, the 
the more we are in online teaching, some, sometimes we are going to feel now resistance to now go out uh, from our houses and go back to the classrooms. I think uh, we have these ambivalent feelings of uh, staying the way we are, but also wanting to go back to the way things were before the pandemic. My colleagues have something to say. Well, it's already time. It's already 11.02, so we don't have time to answer more questions. But you have our emails, and whenever you want, you can inbox us or email us, and we will gladly answer all the questions, like the one regarding patients and everything else that you were asking. <laughs> but uh, you can tell us whenever you want, okay? So thank you very much, guys. Thank you for coming, and thank you to everybody that is seeing us uh, on Facebook Live. Thank you. Pues muchísimas gracias a, a todos. Este, les quiero hacer lectura para su constancia. Hablar. Ya, ya listo. <risa> Dice la Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua y Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, otorga la presente constancia a la doctora Ana Cecilia Villarreal Ballesteros por participar en la conferencia de la 43 tercera semana del humanismo. Ética y educación. Ajá, la voy a leer ya desde acá porque no alcanzó a leer ahí. Ética y educación como herramientas contra la brecha social. En la, en la conferencia, en la conferencia Pre and During Pandemic Reflective Service Teachers. Eh, eh, que se llevó a cabo el 5 de octubre de el, uh, del 2021 de 10 a 11 de la mañana. Y pues muchísimas gracias por, por haber estado con nosotros. Eh, así finalizamos este espacio en la cuadragésima tercera semana del humanismo para nuestros estudiantes y docentes. Les recordamos seguir pendientes de la programación del día de hoy en el marco de actividades de Muchas nuestros gracias. estudiantes. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Hasta luego. Adiós. Y pues continuaremos con la participación de la Academia de Lengua Inglesa con el doctor David Iván Picasso Sa Sam, Sam Roya. Sam Ripia, del colectivo Veleta, la presentación del libro Centro de Justicia de las Mujeres en Chihuahua a cargo de las maestras Nitia Castorena, Erika Mireya Mendoza y la magistrada Ilian Yacel Villanueva, el cuerpo académico 088, estudios de la información y la presentación del libro Filosofía Política a cargo del doctor Santi Esteban y el doctor Ransom Lawrence Cardi. Muchas gracias. <música>